Well, welcome to this Jack Kemp Oral History Symposium on Jack Kemp and the 1988 presidential, Republican presidential primary. Uh, this is a project of the Jack Kemp Foundation. My name is Jimmy Kemp, <clears throat> and I'm privileged to be president of the Jack Kemp Foundation. Uh, my father, in 1988, ran a campaign that all of us were incredibly proud of. My two sisters, Jennifer and Judith, uh, worked in New Hampshire and Iowa and many other states on the campaign while I was in high school and my older brother Jeff was playing football for, let's see, he was with the Seattle Seahawks at that time. Um, and as a family, it was an incredible time. Um, Mom and dad were traveling, they loved it. And here at the Jack Kemp Foundation, our mission is to develop, engage, and recognize exceptional leaders. Some people say, I wish Jack was here today. What would Jack do? Um, a more important question, we think, is what did Jack do? And the Jack Kemp Oral History Project is an effort on our part to identify what it is that my, fa my father did. Um, and this symposium is focused on his 1988 presidential primary run. I'd like to read a, a, a commentary from my father on that campaign and what drove him uh, to run for president and to share his ideas with the country. I campaigned on the ideas of freedom, growth, and the family. That freedom of thought and freedom of economic initiative are the linchpins of a prosperous society. That contrary to the doomsayers in both parties, there are no limits to what free men, free women, and free markets can accomplish. That our Judeo-Christian values must be nurtured and protected if self-government is to endure. That in order to preserve this most precious legacy, we must meet threats to the United States of America with resolve and promote peace through strength. Dad's words live on. Um, and this Kemp oral history led by Morton Kondracki is an effort to capture those words and the experiences of those who worked alongside him and with him um, and it enabled him to become the leader that he was. Thank you for taking the time to be with us and your interest in these itch issues which we believe are so important uh, to not only our country but our world. Thank you. I'm Morton Kondracki. Uh, welcome to this Jack Kemp Oral History Project Symposium uh, with key participants of the 1988 campaign. Uh, today is May 3rd and we're at the Capitol Hill Club in Washington, D.C. Um, first, we're going to play a uh, clip from Jack Kemp's announcement speech in 1988. Ladies and gentlemen, six years ago, the leadership of our president and our party jarred our country from despondency, ended a long retreat, and rekindled a renaissance of hope here at home and throughout the free world. We rejoice steady progress under Ronald Reagan's leadership these past six years, but we have so much to do and a long way to go as we get ready for the decade of the 1990s. Like the Good Shepherd, America must reach out to the weak and to those who have fallen behind. That has always been the strength of America. There are those in both political parties who look to the future with such anxiety and such pessimism that they can think only of ideas that would impose austerity and pain, protectionism and isolationism. At a time when families are under stress, they would meet the challenge of budget deficits by increasing taxes, cutting back on Social Security, weakening our national defense. They would meet the challenge of global competition by raising new walls to foreign imports they would meet the challenge of securing global peace by conceding territory and human freedom to those adversaries who respect the rights of neither. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a better way. There's a more confident way. That's why we're here. America must have a vision for the future that includes victory. A victory for the idea that there is nothing wrong with America that cannot be fixed. A victory for the idea that there are no long as we don't limit our people. A victory for the American idea 
of peace, prosperity, democracy, and freedom. Not just for America, but for Americas. Not just for this hemisphere, but for the whole world. I believe that our future begins with faith. Faith in the Jeffersonian ideal that God is the author of life and liberty. That he is the author of our personal freedoms. Political, economic, and religious, that these freedoms are at the heart of all human progress. No government in history has been able to do for people what people have been able to do for themselves when they were free, when they were free to hope and dream and aspire. The American dream is not to make everyone level with everyone else, but to create the opportunity for all people reach as high as their God-given potential allows. Ladies and gentlemen, there is one office that can mobilize the ideas, the talent, and the dedication to help unite our nation, make our lives more meaningful, our world more secure. Understanding the solemn responsibility Recognizing the historic opportunity of this day, I announce my candidacy for the President of the United States. Good, thank you. Um, we're going to uh, have everyone introduce themselves uh, uh, d coming down the line. Uh, say what you did during the campaign and why you signed on. Charlie? Uh, Charlie Black, I was campaign manager. Um, I signed on because I thought Jack was the greatest political leader of his generation, and I now know, in fact, he was the greatest leader of his generation in, in America. Frank? Uh, Frank Cannon, I was Director of Administration. I was involved in all the operations of the campaign and uh, involved in fundraising. And I, I think having watched that, I'm just reminded that Jack's message is incredibly timeless, that there was a transformation in conservatism that made it optimistic, forward-looking, and available to every American. And it's exactly what motivated me to be, want to be in that campaign and why I think it's very important that we look at what he did as it applies to what, what is necessary to move conservatism and indeed the country forward now. Mona? I'm Mona Charon. Um, my job was to tell Charlie Black what to do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I was, uh, I was a speechwriter, um, and um, I had previously been um, working in the Reagan White House. Uh, and in around 1986, a lot of us were sort of deciding who we, which horse we wanted to back in 1988, and um, you know, a lot of people were signing on with George H. W. Bush, who was the vice president, sitting vice president, and I did not want to work for Bush. I wanted uh, to uh, throw what, whatever support I could, whatever limited things I had to offer, um, to Jack Kemp because, as the others have said, I found him incredibly inspiring, and uh, I thought that he was the intellectual. Um, godfather in many ways of the greatest successes of the Reagan presidency and I thought he you know was much more um, exciting candidate and uh, so that's why I signed up. Uh, my name is Marcy Robinson I was the Congressional Press Secretary during the campaign. Um, I come uh, to the Kemp camp from a little bit of a different outlook. Uh, I was a big-time lefty <laughs> I worked for CBS and then uh, became a <laughs> convert. Uh, I became a Kemp Republican and a very enthusiastic one. Um, and I echo everything uh, that was said, uh, but in particular it was his optimism uh, and focus on every American uh, on the economic scale that attracted me to him. Okay, I'm going to ask each of you another uh, another question, and and uh, the, I know that you've all had vivid memories of your association with Jack Kemp, but if you could remember two or three of the most vivid, just 
anecdotes, what would they be, Charlie? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, was, um, I was thrilled to see Jack speak at the 1980 Republican National Convention because it was the first time that he demonstrated to me that he could play in the big leagues, in, in the major leagues. And in fact, I had the chance to, uh, <clears throat> that weekend after the, after the convention speech, to, to go with him to uh, meet the press, where he was asked to appear. And uh, he also, that day, uh, did a remarkable job on, on meet the press under the typical kind of uh, tough questioning. And so I didn't talk to him right then, in, in the uh, summer of 1980 about running for president, but it was the first time I got interested in that. Uh, the, the other anecdotes would be more personal, that uh, if Jack was your friend, it, it did not matter um, what you did or if you made a mistake or you got in some kind of trouble, he was your friend. And uh, had always, uh, uh, in my case, and I think in most people's case, looked out for your interest. If he thought you needed something, he'd call and try to provide it if he possibly could. But also, it was great fun um, when you got the chance to uh, sit in the camp household during football games and uh, hear him talk back to the television and uh, <laughs> prove that he knew a lot more than uh, Brent Musburger did about what was going on in the game and uh, occasionally take a, a shout out at Jennifer or Judith or Jimmy about uh, something that they were, they were in the way of the TV set or something. But uh, with Jack, he was, he was the optimist not only in public but also in private and always in any setting, he was the leader of the group. Right. Um, I'm going to steal the first one from my wife because to me it's the quintessential uh, Kemp story. My wife uh, was Mary Brunette at the time and she was the deputy press spokeswoman on the campaign and were one of, I think, six couples that uh, became engaged through the campaign. So it was a very prolific campaign in terms of <laughs> producing children and grandchildren of the, of the Kemp campaign. But um, she talked about um, Jack visiting with the um, ambassador to the, uh, from China to the United States. And Jack was, they were discussing the one child policy. And they went on and Jack in his very personal way started talking to him about himself, his family, what was going on. And he asked him how many kids he had and he, the ambassador took out his uh, wallet, showed him three kids and Jack said, which two of them would you like to get rid of? <laughs> and what, what I like about that as a story is that it was the courage and straightforwardness of Jack. It was the personal level of Jack to be able to engage the person he was dealing with, even at a high level, to make them have to think and look at it. And it was the idea that he was going to fight on that principle even if it was awkward. And I, and I love that story. I wish I had actually been there, but it's, uh, it's my, uh, my, my favorite story I've heard from those who with him. What I, what I remember most about him was the fact that he couldn't avoid the human part of the campaign. He was so natural at it. But it would, it would disturb speeches. He'd be in the middle of bringing a crowd to tears. And he'd be, uh, uh, you know, talking about great principles. And he'd see somebody like Mark Siljander who had retired from Congress and he'd wave and say, hey, Mark, how you doing? And suddenly, you know, it would stop. And it, would, it was infectious. He really cared about the, the people that were around him, the people that he'd worked with. And to, to him, people were more important, I think, than almost it, than anything else. His own family, start, you know, starting there, but also in policy, he saw him in terms of real living human beings. Laura? Um, yeah, I'll f follow up on Frank's comments because um, you're know, looking over the course of the years as I have watched politics um, since having worked for Jack, you know, you often see people in politics who you think, oh, you know, they have tremendous talent and they have all the right, you know, sort of positions or many of the right positions from our point of view. Um, but, but being a good candidate requires 
an incredible mix of things. You can't you can't um, be a successful candidate unless you have all of them. And um, and I'll tell you the first time that I met Jack, I saw um, with my own eyes that he clearly had one of the traits that makes for a successful politician. Um, I, at the time, I was working in the White House, and I had gone over to the Heritage Foundation uh, for the afternoon. There were a few speakers. Jack was going to be one of them. And uh, so there were a group of us from the White House, about uh, oh, between eight and ten staffers, who were backstage um, and uh, were going to be introduced to Jack before he went out to give his talk. So he came in, and he shook hands with all of us and, you know, exchanged a couple words and uh, got our names. And then he went off, and he gave a half an hour speech. And when he was finished, he came back through the same room where we were all still waiting, and he said goodbye to each one of us by name. Um, that's a real talent. And that shows that, you know, he, first of all, a great memory, but also that he paid attention to people and he sort of internalized who you were. And uh, he would, I've never, I never saw him forget anybody's name. I, I'm notoriously bad about this myself. So I was very impressed that, uh, that he always seemed able to remember people. Um, and, uh, uh, and he had, um, he had tremendous political courage um, and would uh, take positions that, would anger people on his own side and certainly people on the other side, um, but uh, but I think that he was he was an extremely principled um, a principled politician. Um, I think the thing that I enjoyed most working uh, the thing that I enjoyed most about working with Jack Kemp was that you always knew he was sincere, and uh, I don't think anyone ever really questioned his sincerity. Uh, whether it was, you saw it across the board in his life, whether he was um, thinking about his son's football game that he wasn't going to miss, both sons, um, or any of the causes that he was championing. And um, sometimes he, he did take on fights with or without the support that he needed uh, to win because he just thought it was the right thing to do. Um, I can remember quite a few, <laughs> quite a few of those incidences. Um, he also had a very playful side to him that um, should really not be overlooked. He had a great sense of humor, um, and often liked to play tricks on staff, and we often liked to play tricks on him. Um, and he enjoyed it, and he allowed for that kind of camaraderie, which was very healthy, especially if you had someone who was going to dissect every issue from every angle and put you through the ringer to make sure that he is very uh, secure in taking the position that he was going to take on. Um, I remember one time we were walking back from a press conference or a vote, and we were cutting through a building, and then there was an escalator going down. There was a little hallway over there. and. Uh, John Buckley and one or two other staff members were walking ahead and going down the escalator, and he thought it would just be so much fun to hide in the hallway and have everyone going down the escalator looking for him. And, <laughs> and that happened more than once. I mean, he, he just enjoyed those little pranks. But the very bottom line, and I, what strikes me more than anything, is his optimism and his sincerity. So Charlie uh, and everybody else, so w when and how did you get signed on to the campaign? Uh, and what did you think at the time were Jack's prospects of actually getting the nomination? Well, we actually, uh, several of us, in, in, including Frank and Jeffrey Bell, who's here, and uh, one of my partners, Roger Stone, one of my partners at the time, we really started working with Jack in 1984. and. Um, it, it was sort of a tacit plan to get him prepared to run for president. He didn't have to commit to it, and we didn't expect him to, and, and he didn't really make the decision until sometime in uh, the second half of 1986. But that group that had formed around him pretty much was the makings of a campaign team. We had to go out and recruit some other staff people and some other uh, uh, experts and, and media production and, and that kind of thing. But um, Listen, he was, he was the best political leader of that time, but he knew and we knew that his nomination was a long shot. Uh, no sitting congressman representing only one congressional district had been nominated since uh, the uh, 19th century, number one. Number two, his opponents were the sitting vice president of the United States 
and the Republican leader of the U.S. Senate, who had been the majority leader uh, of the U.S. Senate, both of whom had universal name identification uh, in the country as well as with Republicans. Jack was well known to the activists and the party leaders, but when we started this, his hard name identification among Republican voters was about 25 percent. Uh, the other two had a huge financial base from raising money for themselves and, and for others nationally for many years. Jack didn't have a, a very large financial base. We, we weren't starting from scratch exactly, but uh, we had to work for every dollar as, as Frank can, can vouch for. So, uh, and I should say, we, at the time we planned this race, in uh, late 86, early 87, we did not realize that Pat Robertson would be such a huge factor in the race as, as the first, uh, it, there was an evangelical constituency in the Republican Party for many years, but as, as the first uh, evangelical leader with a national following to go attract that constituency, he turned out, in, in fact, uh, to be more dangerous to Jack's chances than, uh, than Bob Dole did. But, at any rate, I think we were realistic, but he did it for the right reasons. He did think he was the rightful heir to the Reagan mantle and wanted to take the Reagan revolution to the next step, take it further, as you heard at the beginning of his announcement speech. And we were all on board. We believed in him. We thought he was, he was the best uh, person to be president. So uh, we had fun with it, and I don't think until we actually lost that we considered it lost. Yeah. So uh, up until the time that he, uh, I mean, he, he had been identified as somebody who was going to run for president for a very long time, and there was a gearing up that began in 84, as you suggest. Between that time and the time that he actually made the decision, was there ever any doubt that he was going to run? Oh, I, I wouldn't have guaranteed it. I thought it was, you know, 90% or so, but at some point he and Joanne sat down with the family and uh, said, okay, we got, we got to make this decision. Uh, look, he knew if he ran, he would give up his house seat. And that would mean he either won the long shot chance to be president or he'd have to go find a new job, uh, uh, a, a third career. And so he, he was courageous and, and risked everything. So there wasn't a guarantee of that until he and the family made the decision. Mm -hmm. So when did you sign on? Um, I worked for the political action committee prior to that and uh, it was pretty standard at that point that you'd have a pl uh, political action committee a foundation and whatever office you held and each of those would work on various aspects of creating a um, profile for a national figure allow them to participate in elections around the country allow them to produce books make trips to things so I worked I was deputy director of the political action committee I guess starting in 86, and then with the intention that, that, that uh, uh, Jack would run. But I want, I want to emphasize something that Ch Charlie said. I mean, I was 25, so I assumed we were going to win. But, um, you know, and it didn't really have a, a practical sense of all of the, of the elements that it would take. But I remember Jack asking and what the, what the financial figure was going to be to be able to be a serious presidential candidate. I remember Charlie saying it was about $25 million at that point. I mean, it's, you know, you can see how much things have changed to today, but $25 million with the $1,000 limits was an incredible amount to try, to try to raise. And to try to do that with a base that was really a con congressional base rather than a Senate or vice presidential base was, a, was an enormous, enormous task. And that was one of the things that from the beginning was something that the others really didn't have to, have to uh, spend that much time thinking about, but where we had to concentrate step by step by step to try to reach what was a, a reasonable figure for the race. And I th think we got to 17 or 18 million dollars by the end of the... Actually, with right. the, ma with the federal matching funds, we were over 20, 20. Not, not too far shy right of 25. 25. But it, it took everything we had to get to that point. So, uh, Charlie, so how did, how did you uh, set about creating a, a campaign organization? I mean, who did, you, who did you hire first and second and third and so on, and how did you, how did you build the organization, and who were the key people that you recruited? 
Well, we, we hired, um, and by the way, in a campaign like this, we were all involved in one way or another in helping to organize the states, especially those of us who had worked in the Reagan campaigns because we knew who the key players were in the states. But we hired a woman named Dan Stanley, who was a, uh, an organizer. She, she had worked for Reagan, but also for the uh, Republican Congressional Campaign Committee, had run a number of... Uh, uh, congressional campaigns around the country who was a great nuts and bolts organizer and we hired Ann to organize everybody else and to get the states organized. You're going to hear from some of our state leaders uh, on the next state and regional leaders on the the next panel but we we had very good success at attracting some of the most effective people in the Reagan organization and in the conservative movement around the country. Uh, we had to run heavy on volunteers we didn't have the option to go into a state and hire 12 or 15 people uh, to pay them to organize. We, we'd hire one or two, then they had to go recruit volunteers to do the rest of the work. And I think that in terms of the grassroots organization, we certainly were more effective for the money spent than uh, the other campaigns who had more money and could go put more people on the payroll. Uh, so so uh, uh, Jeff Bell had been a long-standing ally of, of Jack's from tax reform days and so on. <clears throat> he became the issues director, is that right? Well, Jeff was actually more than that. He was uh, the campaign director. He was, he was more or less the number two guy to look after things uh, under me. And Frank, as he said, was the director of operations. And so he was kind of like the COO in terms of getting the detail work done in the campaign. Frank did it, but uh, Jeff did play a major role in issues and policy. Um, he was philosophically an alter ego to Jack on a lot of these uh, more complex issues like uh, monetary policy uh, where I could only listen and pretend I knew what they were talking about. Jeff could go toe to toe with, with Jack and uh, for that matter with Jude Winiski and Lou Lehrman and others of similar intellect. So he played a, an important role in that and Jeff also was the sort of the final um, uh, arbiter of what issues we should be talking about at a given time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and what about John Maxwell? Who was he? Uh, well, John Maxwell ran the political action committee during that stage of 1985 and 86. And uh, the political action committee managed Jack's travel around the country and, and kept names of people who might be willing to be involved in the campaign later. And your, your partner, Roger Stone, what did he do? Well, Roger, uh, did a lot of the political organization in the Northeast, especially in New Hampshire. You're going to hear from uh, our New Hampshire folks in a few minutes, but, but uh, Roger had, had worked New Hampshire and, and all the Northeast for Reagan. He also knew the Reaganites around the country, so he was very valuable in uh, identifying the people we should be recruiting and helping recruit them. Okay, so in, uh, in February of 87, you, you get Ed Rollins aboard. Now, mm -hmm. how, how did that work? How did you, and, and th I gather at the time, since Rollins had been Reagan's 84 campaign manager, this was a big coup? It was a big coup for Jack. Um, Ed had been White House political director and then the uh, campaign manager of the successful 84 Reagan campaign. So it, it, at this time, he was, uh, if not the biggest name in Republican politics on, at the operative level, certainly one of the top two or three, and uh, Ed would have, uh, I think, been welcome in any of the other campaigns, but he liked Jack, and Jack recruited him. Uh, I mean, Jack I, personally recruited yeah, him? Yeah, I helped some, but, but it was Jack who got Ed to come on board, which was a, a big coup for us and a big addition to the campaign. Okay, um, and uh, how did you all relate to this kitchen cabinet? I mean, the Jude Winiskis and the Irving Crystals and Lou Lehrman and those, those kind of people. I mean, where were they? What role did they play? We actually had several different groups, uh, sort of a revolving kitchen cabinet, if you will. And uh, I don't think they ever all got together, but maybe once or twice in the course of the whole campaign and the planning. But there was uh, the, the group you mentioned, sort of the uh, intellectual advisors. Uh, they would come in and meet with Jack. Jeff might be there, even Mona or uh, uh, somebody else in the policy staff. I wouldn't necessarily be in that meeting. The congressional uh, colleagues 
advisory that we had a number of Jack's colleagues who were uh, for him and working for him, but his closest friends were Ben Weber, Newt Gingrich, Trent Lott, one or two others. They would meet sometimes uh, uh, for dinner uh, frequently at the Kemp home, and I would usually be in those discussions. Then you had the really, the really close family uh, group of Tom Kemp, who was a tremendous help in the campaign, and Dick Fox and a couple others who Jack had, had commissioned to sort of uh, look over the shoulders of the staff and make sure that we knew what, where we stood financially, which was a, a wise thing to have, having uh, smart business people play that role. Um, you, did you have a lot to do with Tom Kemp and, and Dick Fox? And what, what did they actually do? Well, they, they did two things. One, there was a certain standard that Jack had developed in the congressional office of maintaining, you know, great correspondence with people he met, uh, being able to uh, uh, respond quickly on issue uh, questions, no matter what they were. And when you have a, uh, a campaign exploding and you go from hundreds of letters to thousands and tens of thousands, they wanted to maintain some quality control over that. And so there was a lot of questioning of, of, of how do you make sure that the Kemp brand and the Kemp uh, uh, quality gets maintained. The second thing was um, on the financial side. I mean, one of the big questions was how do you develop a list from where we were to the kind of list that would stay sustain a presidential campaign? And they were, particularly Dick and, and Tom, were very involved in coming to the understanding that we could prospect at a loss in a way that most entities couldn't, that we could go ahead and get the matching funds that would give us net dollars from that. And then Charlie had developed a way to be able to borrow against that, to be able to fund activities well beyond what any other campaign of our size might have been able, able to do. And, you know, there got to a point where there was a question about whether that was really debt or not, but it was, it was accepted by the bank as collateral because it was guaranteed by the, by the federal. So Dick and Tom were involved in all of that, wanting to make sure that that all went smoothly, that the campaign didn't end with large debt. And I think that, as Charlie said, that was a, it was a great help to make sure that both quality control and financial control so who, was, who, was there. Who was the, uh, the finance director? Uh, Rodney Smith. Mm -hmm. And d who recruited him? And Well, Jack recruited him. He was a friend of mine. And I recommended him, but um, he wasn't so sure uh, how much money you could raise for Jack Kemp. Jack persuaded him to come try, and he became a believer and uh, did an excellent job for us. Okay. Um, so, uh, kind of a baseline, there was a Finkelstein poll in May of 1986 of registered Republican voters around the country. It comes out, Bush 40, Dole 8.5, Howard Baker 8.1, and Jack Kemp 6.6, .6 with, I mean, Bush with a, with, a, with a huge lead. So, what was the strategy for winning the nomination against a sitting vice president? Uh, let, let me give you a summary rather than uh, take up the rest of the hour with the with a more detailed we'll strategy. Get to that. We'll get but, to the detail. But um, the system operated then just as it does today, that Iowa and New Hampshire tend to serve as a filter and South Carolina as a further filter to narrow the race down to two or three people and then you go, depending on the year and what the calendar is and how the delegates are allocated, you go down the calendar for a while and then somebody gets an overwhelming lead and it's over. In, in those days, Iowa and New Hampshire were first and second, just like they are now. There was a Michigan contest that was earlier, uh, but it wasn't a primary or a caucus. It was a, a set of county caucuses. I, I don't, I don't want to get off track on that, but at any rate, the strategy was that Jack had a very good opportunity to run well in New Hampshire. And before he could, starting as he did, third in the race, or maybe even fourth when Pat Robertson got up ahead of steam, before you could take on Bush, you had to get past Dole. You had to become the, the second place person in the race. The place we thought we could do that was New Hampshire. 
So Iowa, which had many more social conservatives in the electorate uh, than economic conservatives, uh, we had to just sort of figure out how to survive Iowa and then get to New Hampshire, which had very few relatively social conservatives to economic conservatives. Jack, of course, was a social conservative, but his, his message was uh, treated as economic fiscal tax reform message. So um, we tried, we set out to finish third in Iowa, expecting to finish behind uh, Bush, Dole and Bush there, but then we had devoted a lot of our time and money uh, and advertising and effort to New Hampshire, hoping we could beat Dole there, finish second to Bush in New Hampshire, and then declare ourselves the, alter the conservative alternative to Bush and go to South Carolina and some more conservative states and, and make it a horse race. That, that's a summary of the strategy. Um, a couple of things happened along the way. The, the most important one was that Pat Robertson showed up in the beginning of the year. Nobody particularly took him seriously as a candidate. He showed up in August at the Ames, Iowa straw poll with bus after bus after bus load of people, um, which was surprising to me, but it didn't shock us as bad as it did the Bush people who ended up finishing third uh, at the Ames straw poll. But Robertson established then that he was going to be a big player in Iowa. So we started working very hard to try to get past him to make sure we finished third in Iowa, and we didn't. We finished fourth, which caused the press, which is the referee of this game, to say, okay, Kemp's out of it now. And just before Iowa, we had been even with Dole in the polls in New Hampshire, and we had the momentum versus Dole. We were in a position, um, if we executed properly, to finish second ahead of Dole in New Hampshire. but. The fourth place finish in Iowa uh, cut the legs out from under Jack's candidacy. Yeah, I believe we were at 18 percent at uh, one point, and was, we're moving clearly into second into into New Hampshire right before that. And the other thing is that um, <clears throat> Robertson trained his fire on us. Yeah. He ran commercials and did his ground game targeted at taking the voters away from. From Jack specifically, and so, what 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 was he what was his case? What was he arguing? Um, social seriousness about social conservatism, uh, things like that. But he had, you know, he had uh, stances like uh, belief in millennial economics, and you know, it was a, it was a deeply religious appeal to evangelical voters about how he he connected with them a lot better, and he ran um, a substantial amount of of radio and stuff aimed directly at us okay. in Iowa. Um, Mona, so on the on a on a sort of a candidate identification level, I take it that the, that what Jack was trying to do was to identify himself as the natural heir to to Ronald Reagan. And so, how was it, you, you had Vice President Bush, who was after all Vice President. So, how was he going to separate himself or distinguish himself? from Bush as, as Reagan's heir. Right. Um, well, to the degree I remember it, I think that we did, uh, we did talk about the, uh, and you guys can correct me if I'm not remembering it properly, but uh, that the, uh, all the other candidates in the race had been for raising taxes at one time or another, except for Jack. Um, and Dole was famously, uh, you know, Mr. You know, tax Raiser for the Welfare State. Um, and, uh, and they were not, you know, of course, Bush had been the one to describe um, supply-side economics as voodoo economics, um, and so his claim to be the heir was was suspect. Uh, whereas Jack, of course, had been the author of Kemp Roth and uh, and was uh, the the intellectual father of uh, of the supply side, at least uh, at least um, for a politician in the political realm uh, of uh, of the supply side revolution that uh, was so responsible for the Reagan boom, and so. Uh, so that was the that was the pitch, um, and uh, but of course, as uh, as Jack and as uh, Charlie and Frank have have pointed out, it was extremely difficult to um, run against a sitting vice president, and also this this sort of blindsiding um, swipe by 
Pat Robertson. I mean, you know, Jack, these days, um, you know, conservative, uh, social conservative candidates are frequently just that, and economically conservative candidates are often just that, and Jack really did combine them in a completely sincere and passionate way. Um, and uh, I think if it had not been for Robertson, uh, he, you know, he would have had a, a, a real claim to those conservative, those social conservatives in Iowa. Marcy, was there anything that the that the congressional office could do to sort of set up issues that would distinguish Jack from Bush and Dolan? Bush was always suspect on economic policy and taxes, and Dole was always suspect as being viewed at not so much an issue specific. I don't think, in my view, Charlie is really the executive interpreter of all of this, but um, he was seen as a deal cutter, and so his word wasn't as trustworthy, I think, at, at, when you're looking at the base of the party that was voting. Um, so hammering, you know, anytime there was an opportunity, to hammer Jack's message. And, and keep in mind, Jack refused to go negative. <laughs> that was a big problem for everybody. <laughs> um, and Robertson was going negative. And when you go negative early in a campaign, it's deathly. <laughs> um, well, how did Robertson go negative? What's the, what's the worst I'm sort trying of thing to remember. Everything uh, from a whispers campaign about nonsense to the ads, which I don't really remember. Frank and Charlie could probably address or the Iowa people could address more well, the, the, concretely. The, quickly, the radio ads he ran in Iowa were based, you can't trust Jack Kemp on Right to Life. You could look, go listen to him speak, you'll never hear him mention it. Uh, that, that kind of a pitch that was inaccurate, but. It, 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 was, it was large volume and, uh, and high impact, um, especially after, you know, the Iowa caucus really became, I think, critical after that because he was able to go from being thought of as a silly candidate in, in some ways to producing, I think it was a thousand people for the Ames caucus. And that made him a much more serious candidate. And that was the point at which he started to run, run, uh, run the ads. So um, famously, Jack didn't, didn't know how to deliver a negative message himself, right? Uh, Charlie, yeah. I mean, well, he, no, look, he, wouldn't. He, um, he wouldn't. He wouldn't. Not. He was opposed he to it. Jack, uh, that's what I meant. True okay. to his personality <laughs> and his leadership philosophy, wanted to win on ideas, and he didn't want to tear anybody down. Now, he was willing to debate ideas. So, like in the candidate debates, um, he would talk to the other guys about their records and draw distinctions on the issues. He also um, uh, upon persuasion, believed in counterpunching. And so if, if uh, Bush or Dole took a shot at him, then we could get him uh, to respond, not defensively, but to counterpunch. But no, he, he was uh, uh, largely the positive, optimistic person who believed in running on his merits and not tearing other people down. He did adapt to it over the last couple of months of the campaign. We can't say that he lost because he wouldn't go negative. He just didn't. Uh, well, how how what's the what's the most negative he ever got? Well, he told Bush and he turned around to Bush in a debate and said, uh, "If you're the nominee of this party, the Reagan Revolution is over." Yeah. That was pretty personal. Um, <laughs> but that, he, that was it, that was right at the end, right? South Carolina. He, would, he hit Dole pretty hard about uh, tax increases in uh, Tefra in '82, and uh, even said, uh, "You know, you and your." Colleagues in the Senate persuaded Reagan to raise taxes when he otherwise never would, and that kind of thing. But no, compared to some of the stuff you hear today, uh, <laughs> wasn't very negative. No. He also had us on a leash. I mean, he really did not want us to even to hint at being negative. I mean, he really, you know. Well, I mean, John so, took some shots at yeah, other John candidates. Buckley, John Buckley, but, who we've I've interviewed, you know, who was his campaign press secretary. Right. Was the negative was that was the the uh, the negative campaigner as I get it to the point where the Bush family decreed that he was not to be employed by the Bush administration at all. So what did John say about about uh, Bush and Dole and all that? Do you, <laughs> does anybody remember? Sure. Um, look, John. 
John was uh, brilliant intellectually and very witty. And so he would, he would use the kind of little quips. Uh, I can't cite one specifically right now, but you can go back and find them, where uh, you know, Bush would say something about uh, uh, now is not the time to increase taxes, and he, John would say something like, how would a rich guy know? Wonder if he knows how much tax he pays, or with Dole he'd repeat some of the, you know, it was actually the, it was Newt that came up with the line that Bob Dole was the tax collector for the welfare state, and so John had a habit of quoting other people like that, you know, and uh, it did. Uh, uh, President Bush 41, who Jack and a lot of us worked for later when he was the nominee, uh, had and has a fairly thin skin about some of these what he considers personal attacks. So you have Buckley, Buckley sacrificed for the cause, <laughs> fell on the sword. He did okay. It might have been the line that I think I remember one of them that the Bush uh, supporters were out at coming out parties and the Kemp supporters were at bowling alleys and roasting hot dogs or something like that. It was, he was so clever at just framing yeah. uh, George, George Bush as being somewhat out of, it, out of touch, which stuck unfortunately, and then um, being very rich and Bob Dole being slightly bitter and um, a deal cutter. I mean, that was... Not that we're for attacks on the rich, right, mind but, you. <laughs> <laughs> but it, there, was, there was a little bit of that and it came through in a, in a very clever way. So in, uh, in May of 86, <clears throat> Ben Elliott, who was Reagan's, Ronald Reagan's chief speechwriter, joins the Kemp campaign. Was that viewed as a big coup too? Oh, certainly it was among among people in the in the biz, in the intellectual community and the business of writing speeches. Uh, ben had a terrific reputation, as, as did Mona and some of the uh, the other intellectuals who joined our our campaign. So, how did it, how did the speech writing shop work? <clears throat> well, um, when Jack used to introduce me as his speech writer, um, I used to say, "Well, I write them; he doesn't." very often deliver them uh, <laughs> because, um, you know, Jack was ebullient and full of ideas and a little undisciplined. And so um, we would, you know, sometimes we would spend days working on a speech and, you know, going back and forth with drafts and uh, he would critique what you had done and tell you you wanted to do this differently or that differently. So you'd really, you know, you'd work hard. And then you'd go to the event and um, Jack would have the speech with him and he'd be up there on the podium and, you know, he'd begin to give the speech and then he'd pull a clipping out of his vest pocket and say, you know, this was in the Times today and I really have to, you know, <laughs> respond to this. And, you know, and off he'd go on a, you know, and tear the press, about the press that. had the copy of the speech too. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. And yeah. Well, um, we'd eventually get him to give it two or three days later. <laughs> I think we actually, Jack actually delivered 10 to 12 prepared speeches uh, in the course of the campaign, which is, they were all substantive and, you know, very good policy speeches. So that's, that's enough. It just took a, a lot of work to get him to, to quit editing and, and then go give it. Right. I think the other thing was that he, uses, he used speeches as a way to have ideas compete and phrases compete totally understood the thing in complete depth. Ben would write a beautiful, the most beautiful soaring rhetoric and there'd be back and forth over all the precise statements of things in order to get, I think in his mind, to a, a decision about all of the elements of whatever was at issue, uh, foreign policy or, or what have you. And then once it was set in his mind, the speech had served the main purpose, which was it had it had clarified, it had presented it, it had, and then he internalized it and would give it, in his own words, maybe playing off a news clip or something else. Charlie's right, he would give the speech at, at a, a given point, but I think it was more to internalize and to fight out the ideas than, than from just the, the pure rhetorical value of the speech. Well, one, one anecdote. We needed to give a, a detailed agriculture policy speech in Iowa. It was Iowa. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jack said okay, but he was very unenthusiastic about it because he did not think agriculture policy was going to determine the future of Western civilization. So, and, and Jeff uh, was pulling his hair out about this, so 
we got a couple of drafts written and had some stuff that was pretty sound policy. And uh, Jeff sat down with Jack to go over it, and the draft comes back, and it's about two-thirds of it about the goal standard. <laughs> that the, all the farmers' problems could be solved by going to goal. And, I, and we had, uh, we had, because that was what the press used to uh, label him as a, as a stubborn, uh, eccentric intellectual, we had gotten him to commit not to talk about the goal standard. And he did pretty well. He didn't bring it up very much. He loved it if somebody in the crowd asked him a question about it, at any rate getting that speech done and without the gold standard in it, uh, it was terrific agriculture policy. He gave it at, uh, I believe, the Iowa Farm Bureau and uh, never said a word about it again. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so what, were you th what do you think were his best speeches? Uh, well, um, I think his, his basic stump speech, um, which he could do completely extemporaneously, um, was incredibly uplifting, um, and it combined. It was very similar to what you saw in the announcement. Um, you know, it combined a belief in um, uh, the the liberating aspects of human freedom. That that if people are free and are allowed to flourish, that they will um, r raise themselves, but not just themselves, but their whole country. He believed that the Declaration of Independence and uh, was was a document not just for us, but for all time and all places. That it was a, a, a document of uh, of universal application. And so when he would um, when he would talk about those things, I think he was um, he was incredibly inspiring, and and he was at his best. He always uh, brought foreign policy uh, into it as well, and uh, he had an unyielding um, and principled opposition to tyranny, which um, uh, was demonstrated both you know, uh, uh, with regard to regimes of the left and the far right. Um, and uh, he was very consistent and principled about those things. So those were um, his best speeches. And um, I, you didn't ask this, but I'll, I'll add that I think um, where Jack did sometimes get off track is when um, he would allow his interest, sometimes arcane interest in something about economics, to take him off into the realm where the audience just wasn't able to follow him. And he didn't rein it in. You know, he would, he would sometimes give, you know, because he was so excited about the ideas and he was really enthusiastic and he wanted to share it. Sometimes, you know, to a certain degree, you could bring along your audience. But when you started talking about labor and capital and return on that, you know, it, it would begin to get just a tiny bit arcane. And I think, too long. For, and too long, yes. Um, one, somebody said that, uh, and maybe that this is right out of what Charlie's saying, that that you would write a speech for him that had a sound bite in it that the press was meant to take away and put in the lead, and then he wouldn't deliver the, the sound bite. Is that? That did happen sometimes, yeah, he would, yes. He would, I can try to remember, was it Heritage? I can't remember. Michelle Van Cleve will remember. Um, there was a speech that was prepared. A lot of work went into these speeches. I mean, you need to understand that the congressional office was really run almost like a think tank with resident scholars and adjunct fellows that were all over. I mean, everybody would be, it was like a revolving door. You just didn't know who was going to walk in next. And the speech writers, to their credit, Ben and Mona, really worked very closely with the policy team in putting the speeches together because they knew Jack wouldn't <laughs> read it, or if, it were, if it didn't resemble you know, what he really believed in. Um, but he gave out a speech, and everyone had it, and they were waiting. The cameras were all lined up, waiting for the soundbite, and as most camera guys did at the time, waited for the soundbite, ready to pack up and go, and he never gave it. And he started off by saying, I was going to give a speech. You all have a speech I was going to give today, but let me tell you what's really on my mind. Right, exactly. And, you know, <laughs> at which point just, the speech writers were found fainting. <laughs> yeah, I think it was a big foreign policy speech. I could be wrong, but I remember that, that happened more than once. Yeah. Well, did you ever complain to him about that? Did, any, did the campaign yes. complain yeah. to him? Okay, yes. and then what? He would eventually give the speech, usually, <laughs> a few days later. But can I just say one thing that he deserves credit for? That, yes, he always talked a long time. And having traveled some with Jack for years and years, he would go into a setting where he was expected to talk 30 minutes, and an hour and 10 minutes later, uh, he, he would stop. And I would ask him why, and he'd say, listen, those 300, I may never see some of those 300 people again, so they need to hear every idea, every <laughs> idea, every subject had to be covered, and he, and he meant it. But he did, to his credit, the last six months or so of the campaign, uh, 
under, frankly, under pressure from Ed Rollins and me, he got so he could give a 20-minute stump speech. And he got it to 20 minutes. He'd even pride himself sometimes on finishing it at 18. And because a lot of those places, people wanted to do Q&A. And it wasn't practical to talk for an hour, then do the Q&A. So he got so he could do it, and he, and he did it pretty consistently for the last five or six months of the campaign. Uh, he dropped out of the race. A week or two later, he made a public appearance somewhere, some state Republican Party or something. He got back and he called me and he said, I spoke 50 minutes. <laughs> I said, you're your own man again. I don't, you don't work for me anymore. <laughs> he, he, he's one of the few politicians who never said anything that he didn't believe or didn't feel comfortable about the way he was saying. Exactly. And that's, that, that's a strength, that's a strength that he had, that anything that he said, he was willing to stand behind, and that's why he cared about the way he said it. Okay, let me, uh, let me just go back to the money, uh, and we'll dispense with this um, for, you know, for, the, for the whole. Uh, you know, there was a fundraiser that you held in November of, of, of 85 in, in New York, black tie, a million dollars. And that was the and it was and it was some sort of record. Then after that, I read through the clips that you were always borrowing against federal funding, or you there was a, a telegram that got leaked about how you were you were desperate for raising cash and stuff like that. So the you know just and uh, some reports were that Jack just hated to raise money, that he hated to make to, to make the phone calls. So how how bad were you off financially? Let me talk generally, then Frank can probably provide more detail, but that fundraiser in New York was for the Political Action Committee, where people could give up to $5,000 or, or 10000 a couple, and a lot of people who didn't later support him for president came and gave money to that. So the money was well used in his travel and making contributions to candidates, but we had, during the course of the presidential campaign, we had a number of high-dollar fundraisers. And some of them would do as much as 100,000 or maybe even 150, but we probably raised a total of three or four million off those events. Jack did not like to make fundraising calls. He didn't mind calling people to ask them to host a fundraiser, all right? So we'd get him to call a few people to be on the committee for the fundraiser, and then we could do that. But we knew going in that we were going to be driven by small donations and direct mail. In those days, you didn't have telemarketing or internet fundraising, it was all direct mail. So direct mail, as Frank alluded to earlier, you invest money in prospecting. You probably take a small loss on that prospecting. But two things. Every one of those small donors was matchable by the Federal Election Committee matching funds. And you, near the end of the campaign, you quit prospecting, go to your house file, those people who have given, and that you make money on. So the, the, uh, the, the kind of... Uh, uh, system you're operating under is you put a few hundred thousand bucks into prospecting, you get 80 percent of it back, you file those donations to the Federal Election Committee, you don't get that money until January of the election year, but the banks considered it good collateral so you'd go borrow against it. So at any given time we probably didn't have much uh, net cash flow, but we, we had that federal money coming with which we paid off the loans and then still had the cash to run in the last couple of months of the campaign. Is that? That, that? That's absolutely right. It became a model for people to use who were non-elite candidates to be able to use grassroots. And I think what was misunderstood was the, the degree to which a, um, a small dollar campaign became reliant on matching funds. I mean, nobody talks about this now because the limits are much higher, the amount of right. participant, mm -hmm. the high dollar end were very high, but we, you had to raise it at $1,000 a chunk, and the first 250 was matchable. So what was precious to you was somebody who gave you $30 five times, seven times, and you, it might have cost you $10 to find them, or it might have cost you $40 to find yeah. that $30 contribution right. the first time. But you got the match the first time, and you got it again and again and again. And I think that there was a complete misunderstanding about that, including among some people with internal to the campaign, about how that dynamic produced net dollars over the whole whole period. So you got a time. worse you got a worse press on 
money raising than you actually was your financial situation? Absolutely. We were able to finance all of the uh, the commercials and the yeah, things that Charlie needed, had yeah. in, in the budget. We met payroll every well, every time. Everybody to, went off payroll in New Hampshire, though. Well, right? You were. We started losing, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, at that point, you're putting every net dollar you can into it. People wanted to sacrifice to be able to give us the best shot that at, we could. But After Iowa, when we finished fourth and the press kind of wrote us out of the race, then we were, to use the correct phrase for this setting, throwing the long ball. Uh, to see what we could do to stay in. So you had to get everybody to work as volunteers and not spend anything except money for commercials and, and on the ground uh, contact in the states. But so, how, you, know, so you know, a Bush or a Dole could go do a bunch of these fundraisers and get a lot of thousand dollar contributions. So they, they got some matching money for it, but they always had a balance without having to borrow money to reinvest in the mail. But in the end, if we could go back and look at our books and we paid off all the loans and had uh, in a neighborhood of 10 to 12 million net that we invested in the campaign. And how much debt did the campaign leave when it was done? Well, the, the, day that the, the day that Jack dropped out of the race, we had all the bills paid and $200,000 in the bank. Now, every campaign has cleanup costs. You got to do all these FEC filings. They do an audit. It costs you a lot of money in accountants and lawyers, uh, but your house file was still good to raise some money. So the 200000 didn't mean that was all was needed to finish the job, but we were in the black on the day Jack withdrew from the race. Mm -hmm. but, but when all is said and done, how much did Jack have to raise to pay off his, all of his debts as a result of the campaign? I, I don't remember the exact Half amount. a million, something like that. But, it, but compared to the size of the file that was loyal to him at that time, it was not, it was not a huge amount, and in fact, were people arguing to go deeper into into debt to be able to spend to spend more? Yeah. But I think that's where Tom and Dick came in that we never got to a position where we weren't able with a a, a, a discrete number of mailings to be be uh, able to take care of the debt. We were never uh, well. Some uh, some some people say that he didn't run in '96 because he didn't want to be in debt again to the extent that he'd been after 88. Is that a f fair? I don't think so. I mean, I don't... I don't. Um, not based on conversations I had with him about running in 96. It didn't come up. That doesn't mean he didn't talk to somebody about it. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, panel one. Uh, we're going to now have the uh, some of the state um, leaders, and then you guys will be back. Thank you.